you for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Emmerich, earlier, uh, Mr. Huma in, was talking about the catastrophic insurance, and I, I believe you, you wanted to expand upon that, about the insurance that's offered to the students, student athletes. Yeah, I sim simply want to make clear that uh, student athletes uh, across all of our divisions are required to have either uh, provided by their family because of employment relationships or the institution to have health insurance. They all have insurance through their time as a student athlete. And should they have injuries while they are a student athlete that exceed the limits of those of that insurance coverage, then indeed there is a, a catastrophic injury policy that the NCAA pays millions of dollars for every year that covers those athletes. And we have had student athletes be uh, covered for significant amounts, $100,000 and more a year for their entire lifetime to cover the cost of their injuries. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, let me ask you, Dr. Ebert, I wanna go back to one of my colleagues, Representative Guthrie, had mentioned the pay for play. And, and that seems like such a, a, a slippery slope in the sense the difference between pay for play. A couple of questions. First of all, what happened in a school out west where the school actually arranged the agreement for a company to give scholarships or to give uh, the to give money or whatever to pay for each of the 123 players on the football team to get the equivalent of tuition. How can that not be pay for play? Well, I, I believe, Congressman, that's part of why we're here today is that we need standardized definitions across the country about what is and what isn't an appropriate relationship around name, image, and likeness. Uh, today, we don't have that. Uh, we, we need some continuity so that both the universities themselves and the athletes know and, and those who enter into those kind of arrangements know what the rules of the game are. It is indeed a slippery slope. Uh, and as we were, we've been discussing here today, one of the keys is, first of all, having those relationships be, be uh, transparent so that people know they're going on. And then there's consistency about whether or not the student athlete, him or herself, is providing something of value in exchange for those resources rather than just showing up and playing football. And, and not necessarily for football or basketball, but, but for some of the other sports especially, if it's deemed to be pay for play, how is this going to impact their eligibility for future Olympics? I mean, if... if you know, a student athlete who has been playing, um, you know, has been on a swimming scholarship or, or, or diving or whatever, and then it's deemed, okay, that was pay for play. Are they going to be eligible for the Olympics once they're finished there? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on Olympic eligibility. But don't but, you think it but, would but be? But I do believe that they probably would be allowed to compete. They would be allowed to compete, so. but don't you think that should be clarified with the Olympic Committee? I would think y'all would. It, clear, it clearly should be. I yes. hope that the NCA will take that upon themselves to to clarify that. Also, another concern because I've heard y'all mention it during the, this this hearing about the revenues go to academics as well to help with that. Isn't there a concern about the sponsorships withdrawing from that and going to the students instead, the student athletes? I mean, at the University of Kentucky, you got Kroger Field. You know, what's, are they still, you, you know, I know at the University of Georgia, we've got the, the earphones or have the Delta uh, emblem on it. And, and, you know, you got Nike jerseys and everything. I mean, are these companies now going to shift to the students and, and away from the schools and therefore the revenues are going to decrease and therefore it's going to go back on the state legislatures to have to fund more for academics, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, has that been looked at? It's, it's certainly been widely discussed. The evidence so far is not clear because we only have you know, two months worth of data, but it's one of the real concerns I know that athletic directors who run athletic programs is very con are very concerned about. And, and with good reason. How are you going to handle, I remember the Olympics when we had the basketball dream team that some of them weren't with the uh, official sponsor. I, I, I forgot who it was, whether it was Nike, and then some of the, the athletes didn't want to wear Nike, so they had to put the, uh, uh, had to cover up the emblem. How are you going to deal with that if a school uses, you know, a certain company, but the student has a, an agreement with another company? Well, again, right now there is a, a patchwork of different laws that approach that issue differently uh, in, in several of the states. Some 
would allow student athletes to be mandated to wear uh, specific uniforms produced by some sponsors. Some do not require that. Some would allow a uh, student athlete to wear the sh shoe brand of his or her choice, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's not clearly regulated today, and it is one of those areas that's a, uh, also a great complexity and why we need a national law. In a nutshell, we got a mess. <laughs> Thank you, and I yield back.